welcome to this episode or to this stream on this channel. Thank you so much for joining us today. I believe that this conversation is going to enrich your faith as well as give you deeper understanding on this mystery of Babylon. In fact, I'm going to read the verse in Revelation chapter 17, verse 5. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I have with me Joel Richardson, who actually has a book, and we have it right here. It's called The Mystery of Babylon. So I read this book, incredible book, and insightful revelations uh, from this book. And Joel has an amazing uh, teaching that we will link in this video below where you can watch about the Islamic Antichrist and about the end times view concerning where the Antichrist will come from and the battle, the last battle, as well as the tribulation and all of this stuff. And we've discussed this before, but today what we're going to do in this video is we are going to talk about this mystery Babylon. So Joel, hello, and I'm glad that you are here today with us. It's great to be with you, Vlad. If we can give a little bit of a background, the history of this mystery, what are some of the historical proposals? So what are some of the ideas that Christians have about what this Babylon is going to represent in the last days? Yeah, so um, in the early part of this book, I try to walk through most of the main theories that Christians uh -huh. have offered. And so you have really both a historical and a last days version of Rome. Mm -hmm. And it's important to make a distinction between those two because there are some that believe Mystery Babylon was historical pagan Rome. And the prophecy is already fulfilled. But it's important to, to recognize there's a difference between historical pagan Rome and modern Roman Catholicism. Um, so you have really those two theories. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, you have historical and present day Jerusalem. So some people think Mystery Babylon was historical Jerusalem, some think it's present day Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. um, then you also have the idea that it's New York City or even... <laughs> That's what I thought when we were in Ukraine. We were um, all uh, taught there was this, <laughs> this teaching. It wasn't from the pulpit, but we all knew that the Babylon is New York. Yeah, yeah sometimes it's New York or sometimes it's the United States at large. Uh -huh. Very common view. I mean, there's probably a dozen books out there arguing that. Wow. And it's a, it's a very popular, persuasive uh, view. Um, then you have the idea that it's the Illuminati mm -hmm. or the New World Order. Um, then you have the idea that it's more conceptual. It's not necessarily a specific city, not necessarily a specific nation. Rather, mm -hmm. it's a concept, like it's apostate Christianity, mm -hmm. um, or it's the world system, mm -hmm. uh, or this sort of thing. And, um, you know, interestingly, it, um, funny story, when I first got saved, um, I went to a tent revival meeting down in Savannah, Georgia, and um, there was a, it, it was a, it had snowed, so I went to this tent revival meeting, I was the only one that showed up. <laughs> so it was the preacher preaching at me, uh, but he told the story of how he and his wife would go to churches on Sunday, they would pull up, they would open the door of the church, and they would yell in, come out of her, my people, and partake. And then they would jump in their station wagon and, you know, drive to the next church. So, you know, there's this idea that apostate Christianity uh -huh. is Mystery yeah, Babylon, Babylon or this sort of thing. Um, and there's a few other theories, but those are the primary theories. So I try to walk through and look at the strengths and weaknesses of all mm -hmm. of these different ideas. Mm -hmm. And in light of um, the Middle East perspective of the end times, um, the Antichrist leading the coalition, most likely, of the Islam nations, because they're all Islam nations around Israel, attacking Israel. And as we've discussed before, where you described that, that the Islamic Messiah is really a description of a Christian Antichrist. Now, reading with that perspective, the book of Revelation, and coming to the city of Babylon, um, this mysterious city uh, that is mentioned in the book of Revelation really poses a lot of questions as well. Okay, what could this city be? Could you give us a biblical characteristic of this city? Sure. Well, first of all, it's a city. Okay. It's very important um, to start there because Revelation is filled with symbolism mm -hmm. um, and metaphors. And this particular woman, she's a, she's a queen, she's a prostitute, she's bloodthirsty, a lot of these different things. But then the angel says, the woman that you saw is the great city. She's actually referred to as a city eight times. Okay. Referred to as the great city, I can't remember, two or three times. Mm -hmm. And so it's a city. 
Um, because what I see is a lot of Christians will go, I think the city represents this. And I go, no, no, no. The woman represents the city. Represents the city. It's not a metaphor within a metaphor. Okay. Um, so it's a very literal city. But it also is the primary um, financial and spiritual or religious capital mm -hmm. of the beast system, if you mm -hmm. will. And this is very important. Those two things, financial influence and spiritual or religious influence. Mm -hmm. um, so it has profound financial and religious influence over the peoples of the mm -hmm. earth. I find it also interesting that you mentioned that, that she imports but not exports. Yeah, it's interesting, as you said, and this is really one of the sort of latter criteria, yeah. but it, it actually lists a lot of the things that she imports, mm -hmm. and, um, and they're luxury, luxury items. items. Uh -huh. um, and then also, it actually even gets into like the types of fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. and different things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, it, she does not seem to be a primary um, manufacturer. Mm -hmm. It's more of an, uh, a nation of consumers. Mm -hmm. And it's also a desert city. Yes, and, and so you have a description. It says, I saw the, the woman mm -hmm. riding a beast, and it's in a desert. Mm -hmm. And that's not just a peripheral, irrelevant point. It's um, not a spiritual desert. Right. It seems to be a literal thing. Because mm -hmm. later you have in Revelation 21, identical statement. He says, then I was taken, um, and I saw on a high mountain. Mm -hmm. And I saw New Jerusalem coming down. Again, that's referring to Mount Zion. It's mm -hmm. literal. It's a literal mountain. And similarly, I believe the woman is positioned in a desert as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you highlight in your book that it's a, um, it's a real city, that it's also a consumer city, um, that it's a desert city, and that it's a port city, and that it's a mega city. Yeah. And as you mentioned, it's also a hub for this spiritual religion. Yeah, so some of these terms are important. It refers to her as Babylon the Great. Mm -hmm. It refers to her as the great harlot, mm -hmm. um, the great city. And so what that means is the mother of all harlots, that's often misunderstood. Um, a lot of people think, well, so she's a harlot, but she is a mother of all these other harlots. Like she has all these little prostitute daughters. Mm -hmm. um, that's not the point of the text. Middle, in the Middle East is filled with expressions, and when mm -hmm. it says the mother of, it just means the biggest, the greatest. Mm -hmm. When Saddam Hussein said, this is going to be the mother of all battles, mm -hmm. he didn't mean it's going to be a battle that's going to give birth to many little battles. He means it's going to be the biggest battle ever. Okay. And so when it calls her Babylon the Great, the great harlot, um, or the mother of all harlots, it is the greatest, most significant, um, source of false religion. And that's what harlotry yes. means. Because yes. when, when I would read that as a younger believer, I always thought it represented pornography, lust, Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So that's why everybody connected that with New York, but then now you're, you're seeing the desert, the port city and all of that. That right away, New York doesn't fit that. So many other cities don't fit that. Can you explain a little bit about the whole harlotry, what that means in a biblical context? Yeah. So, you know, some translations say sexual immorality, harlotry, um, but again, these are metaphors for something else. Okay. And what it represents is false worship. Um, any worship given to any other God other than Jehovah, the one true God of the Bible, mm -hmm. is spiritual adultery, spiritual sexual immorality. So it's referring to idolatry, plain mm -hmm. and simple. Um, and so when it refers to uh, this prostitute, she is the one who influences people into idolatry, into false worship, into a false religious system. Mm -hmm. And because she is Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of all harlots, she is the greatest false religion that mankind has ever produced. Wow. Now, before we talk a little bit more about what this city is, there was a guy named Alexander Hislop, and he wrote a book and this book really influenced some of the Western perception, especially in connection to Rome and, and Europe, uh, Babylon being um, there. Could you speak a little bit about the fallacies of that book and a little bit what that book uh, was about? Yeah. So Alexander Hislop, he was a Scottish minister, um, wrote a book called The Two Babylons uh, in the 1800s. And essentially what he's arguing um, it's, a very, it's, it's a very simple argument, really, that ancient Babylonian pagan religion um, eventually migrated 
into the Roman Catholic Church. Um, it migrated from Babylon to Egypt to Greece to Rome, mm -hmm. and then it was really just um, repackaged in Roman Catholicism. And then even from there, from Roman Catholicism, it's actually extended even into modern-day Protestant churches. And so the idea is this, this early, primordial, false Babylonian religion is still being widely practiced in the earth today, and it's primarily embodied in the Catholic Church. So that was his point. And it was to bolster this, um, the, the, the reformers believed, again, that the Roman Catholic Church was the great harlot, that the Pope was the Antichrist, this type of thing, which is very natural um, because they, they were in conflict. Mm -hmm. um, Christians have a long history of, I call it Antichrist pointing, where they point at their political uh, or theological enemies or mm -hmm. just someone they don't like, and they mm -hmm. go, that guy's the Antichrist. You know, we do it with every president that comes along. Um, especially if they're on the other team, that guy or that whatever mm -hmm. is definitely the Antichrist. And so the reformers were doing that. So Hislop really was just trying to bolster that by really going to the source and saying, no, the Catholics aren't simply misled or confused or wrong. They are the embodiment of satanic religion. And so interestingly, the way he does that is he is a researcher. But his research and his logic is really flawed really, really flawed. And so I, in that chat, in, mm -hmm. in my book, I take a chapter and I try to work through some of his logic to help people to see the, quite frankly, the lunacy mm -hmm. um, of it. So let me give you one example. He says that Nimrod, mm -hmm. um, the Antichrist is essentially the latter days Nimrod. And he tries to say that Nimrod is everywhere kind of throughout history. So he says Nimrod was a hunter and hunters are represented by leopards. Leopard, a leopard is a very common symbol for a hunter, mm -hmm. and leopards have spots. Mm -hmm. So he finds a drawing of a man holding a fawn, a baby deer, but the deer has spots. So that's clearly a connection to leopards. It's clearly the picture that he's looking at is Nimrod. Like, this is the type of connection that doesn't make sense, but when mm -hmm. you read his book, he, it, it, it almost like you fall under his spell. It seems to make mm -hmm. sense. But I personally, and I make a very bold uh, assertion in the book, I actually argue that Hislop seems to display some uh, elements of schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. So schizophrenics, um, you know, you could have an example. I remember some woman was convinced she was watching the David Letterman program. She was convinced he was sending her secret signals. Um, or, you know, mm. um, Charles Manson thought John mm. Lennon was telling him to kill people mm. with the song Helter mm -hmm. Skelter. So when you see something that's not there, that's mm -hmm. schizophrenia. But it's always through these connections. Mm. It's these connections, well, the dots mm -hmm. and this type of thing. And because he's a very thorough researcher, um, he, he applies some crazy logic, but sadly that book has been incredibly influential. And it has echoes that we don't even realize mm -hmm. um, in our circles today. So look, let me just say it this way. Uh, let's say your neighbor is Roman Catholic. Um, as a Protestant, and I'm a child of the Reformation, I have clear disagreements with my Catholic neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a very different thing to say, you are the great whore, you know, like kind of ends conversation at that point. You are the embodiment of satanic false religion. Mm -hmm. um, rather than saying, look, we disagree on the Mary stuff mm -hmm. and salvation by grace through faith, mm -hmm. but we have a lot in common. No, it's like what you teach is literally mm -hmm. the extension of ancient Nimrodian, mm -hmm. Babylonian false religion. Plus, if you go to Italy, I just came from Italy, their prime minister is like supportive of Israel. So I'm thinking, okay, how, how is this, you know, like, and you're seeing even generally Rome or Roman Catholic churches, it's not as powerful as what we see is going to happen in the last days. And it's no longer, the. I mean, maybe in mid uh, dark ages where they had crusaders and everything, but Roman Catholic Church doesn't do that stuff anymore. So in the last days, that's just, just doesn't fall at all with anything that has to do with the last day theology. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we have to be real. Pope Francis and his crew is not planning on beheading us anytime soon. Um, yes, it's a powerful, influential body, but the mm -hmm. reality is so much of their finances these days are mm -hmm. tied up in pedophile priest lawsuits. Um, if we're to be honest, they, mm -hmm. they don't have the power that they used mm -hmm. to have. Now, um, you also mentioned that, that this woman, this city represents this, um, this woman, she's a symbol of this city. And 
she has this partnership, you call it partnership made in hell with the beast, how this woman and the beast, they pretty much create this partnership and then while, while the woman is paired with the beast, she rides the beast and she has the same color as the beast and they both kill Christians and um, but eventually this beast, this antichrist, um, turns against this woman and kills her and um, and you argue this in chapter 7 that this woman must be this capital city of a revived Islamic regime that will come in the last days. Um, can you speak a little bit into that? We're not going to give all the details right now. We're going to still ask a little bit more questions about specifics, how this relates and what city it is. But can you speak about this partnership between what the Bible teaches, the woman and the beast? Yeah. So interestingly, John's looking at the woman and he's fascinated and the angel says, I'm going to tell you the mystery of the woman. But then he mostly talks about the beast. Mm -hmm. So he sees the woman riding the beast. So we begin by recognizing there's a partnership. Like they are a pair, rider and steed. This is the Lone Ranger and Silver. Um, so they're, they're, they're working together. Um, <clears throat> but beyond that, um, he goes into describing the beast. So we have to understand the beast in order to understand the woman. And the beast is essentially seven historical satanic empires. Okay, so we're dealing with Egypt, mm -hmm. Assyria, um, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome is the sixth. So what's the seventh? Um, some people will say, well, the seventh is a revival of the six. No, actually, because in Revelation it says that the Antichrist is the eighth. So I believe that Islam is the seventh empire. These are the seven primary persecuting empires throughout history, throughout biblical history. Mm -hmm. All of them have tried to wipe out or destroy the Jewish people at one particular time. Um, and so I do believe that Islam is the... So in order to understand the woman riding the beast, we have to identify the seventh head, the final manifestation of satanic false mm -hmm. empire, imperialism, and... Um, yeah, so I think I think the the harlot is something that is in partnership mm -hmm. with this beast, and I actually believe that it is the the capital, the capital city, if you will, um, of of Islam. Mm -hmm. Now, if we can go back just a little bit more about why Rome does not fit to be this mystery Babylon. Sure. So first of all, um, it has to be the primary persecutor of both Jews and Christians mm -hmm. in the last days. Um, again, while throughout history, especially during the Reformation, Roman Catholic, you know, Romans, Roman Catholic uh, Catholicism killed a lot of Protestants. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, like you can even go back to Pope John Paul II, he actually publicly repented for that. Mm -hmm. And so we go, well, is the Lord gonna punish the Roman Catholic Church for the sins of the past if they were repented of? Um, and as we said, I don't think uh, the Roman Catholic Church is about to start beheading Protestants and invade the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that doesn't really fit. Um, Rome is also not in a desert. Mm -hmm. um, even numerically, Rome is not the single greatest. Even if you believe Roman Catholicism was pure idolatry, um, just numerically. Right now, Islam is, when I wrote the book, it was at about 1.6 billion. Um, and this is only several years ago. We're pushing two billion now, two billion Muslims. Wow. Um, Islam is far and away, numerically, the largest false religion that mankind has ever produced. Mm -hmm. um, Roman Catholicism is less than half of mm -hmm. the, the numbers of Islam. What about Jerusalem? Could Jerusalem be the mystery Babylon? So this is another very popular view. Um, the problem with Jerusalem is, look, the Bible, like the book of Revelation, tells a story of two women. Mm -hmm. One is Jerusalem, the mm -hmm. other is Babylon. One is portrayed as a woman who is fleeing into the desert, mm -hmm. um, but later she's described in white, clothed with the sun and the stars and this sort of thing, and she eventually descends from heaven um, pure and spotless wow. and blameless. Mm -hmm. But the harlot is this bloodthirsty, brazen prostitute. There's two women. Um, and for people to conflate the two as if they're the okay. same is to radically misinterpret the book of Revelation. Um, the basic storyline, it's like you just talk about like adventures and missing the plot. Um, but the idea, look, 
when you look at the population of Jews, they make up like less than 1% of the global population. The idea that 1%, um, and, and then of the Jews, the percentage that are religious is extra, extra small. Mm -hmm. The idea that they're going to conquer the world and kill Christians and then invade Israel, it just doesn't make sense. Um, mm -hmm. the, the Antichrist is overwhelmingly framed throughout the Bible as a pagan, hostile, foreign invader. Antiochus Epiphanes in Daniel 8 and 11 is the, is the ultimate type of the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. The second is Nebuchadnezzar. They were pagans, they were Gentiles, they were not Jews. Mm -hmm. They were outside invaders and likewise mm -hmm. the ultimate Antichrist will be such. He's not mm -hmm. some religious Jew who's trying to enforce Noahide laws on the earth or this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Look, history is filled with all kinds of crazy conspiracy theories about the Jewish people and many of these conspiracy theories are making a massive comeback today in sort of, you know, YouTube conspiracy mm -hmm. theory, end time culture, and... Um, what about New World Order and Illuminati? Yeah, so this is obviously um, a much bigger umbrella uh -huh. thing and it kind of gives those who hold to this theory um, a lot of stuff to work with. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's funny, I, I in the book I, I, I think I address it a bit. Um, some of these folks believe in aliens and that mm -hmm. the Illuminati are controlled by the aliens, by the reptiles and, you know, mm -hmm. this sort of thing. Like, that whole thing gets into wild stuff. But here's the point, is it's conceptual. Where's the, where's the city? Mm -hmm. Where, what's the capital of the Illuminati? Mm -hmm. Where's the capital of the New World Order? Um, again, Mystery Babylon is a city. It's an mm -hmm. identifiable city. You can look at a mm -hmm. map, you can find it. The Illuminati is conceptual and arguably, um, maybe not even real. Mm. Um, the Illuminati really was an organization that, uh, yeah, it existed probably a hundred years ago, it was dissolved, and they go, oh, they say it was dissolved. You know, but this thing exists in the mind of, again, Christians. Now, I'm not saying there's not globalists, mm -hmm. I'm not saying there's not evil people out there conspiring to do all kinds of things, but mm -hmm. the, the idea that the kingdom of Satan is so unified, so much better than even the kingdom of God, um, that's difficult to believe. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not saying there's not, again, globalists, mm -hmm. conspiracy yeah. theorists and that sort of thing, but the idea mm -hmm. that all of these people are all working together for one unified satanic goal, um, it's just a theory that doesn't make any sense. So coming back to what I was taught in Ukraine about New York being <laughs> the Babylon, there's some good strengths in that. You mentioned that in your book that New York is a little city. It's also a global economic powerhouse. Mm -hmm. But what are some of the weaknesses that that pretty much destroy the idea that New York is the mystery Babylon. Yeah. Either New York or the United States is very simple. Mm -hmm. It's not just an economic powerhouse of influence, it is a religious powerhouse of influence. The United States does not represent a religion. New York City does not represent a religion. People will be like, well, it's consumerism, or it's the idol of um, independence, or, you know, some of these mm -hmm. different American mm -hmm. idols, which, you know, they are, but no. The United States or New York City does not represent a religion which is the, the greatest bloodthirsty religion that is persecuting and killing Christians around the world. Listen, the United States, for all of its many faults, mm -hmm. is still, to this day, the single greatest missionary sending mm -hmm. force financially or in terms of sending the gospel mm -hmm. around the world in history. Mm -hmm. There is no nation that has given more to missions and the going forth of the gospel than the United States or provided more missionaries. We're still, around the world right now, 80% of the missionaries are from the United States. 80% mm -hmm. of the funding for missions around the world. Now that's probably changing mm -hmm. um, a bit. It's probably dropping drastically. But the point is, we are not, look, New York City is not the primary entity that is responsible for the shed blood of the saints. New York City was attacked 20, three years ago mm -hmm. by the religion that is killing Christians mm -hmm. all around the world. In mm -hmm. fact, if you look at Open Doors or some of these reporting mm -hmm. agencies, they highlight the top 40 nations in the earth that are persecuting Christians. And except for North Korea and, you know, a, a couple others, it's dominated by Muslim-majority nations. So mm -hmm. we need to be real. Mm -hmm. And what about, and especially, you actually held that view before that the literal Babylon or the Iraq uh, you know, that mystery Babylon is actually Iraq. What are some strong points for that and what are some weak points for Iraq being the Babylon mystery? Yeah, so that actually is a, you know, like that mystery Babylon, uh -huh. the mystery is, well, it's just literal Babylon. It's going to be rebuilt in Iraq. 
It's you know, not really a mystery then. Yeah, it's really not a mystery at all. But um, it does have some strengths. And the primary strengths are that we're not simply drawing from Revelation 17 and 18, because mm -hmm. that's, that's the passage that we're looking at, mm -hmm. but also from Jeremiah 50 and 51, um, from Isaiah 13 through, I mean, a handful of different passages in the Old Testament that are prophesying the fall of Babylon. Mm -hmm. And so they start drawing from them, in which case, you know, it talks about them being destroyed and thrown into the Euphrates, things like mm -hmm. that. So you go, well, that means it has to be over there. Mm -hmm. But this becomes a very difficult, admittedly, very difficult thing to interpret and parse out because the Bible often, it kind of has these layered um, revelations where it uses the historical fall of Babylon mm -hmm. as a pattern and a shadow of the ultimate last day's fall of Babylon. Mm -hmm. And as Westerners, we love to dissect the Word of God mm -hmm. with a scalpel. Verse 3 through 4 is the historical Babylon, verse 5, and oftentimes it doesn't do it that, it just kind of, and that drives us crazy because we don't like that sort of mm -hmm. layering, um, but it becomes very difficult to sort of, uh, as I said, dissect what's talking about mm -hmm. what. And so some of the big problems, for example, is it just like, for example, in Jeremiah 15 and 51, it talks about the walls of Babylon and the gates of Babylon being burnt. Well, so is Babylon going to be rebuilt with walls and a giant gate and it's going to be burnt and destroyed? Like, there's no cities anymore mm -hmm. that are built like that. It's clearly anachronistic. It's describing the ancient mm -hmm. walled city, um, this type of thing. And the other, obviously, glaring problem is that it doesn't exist yet. There's nothing there. There's not even mm -hmm. any construction that has started. So if indeed uh, Babylon is going to be rebuilt in Iraq, the return of Jesus is at a minimum 20 to 30 years away. Mm -hmm. And Iraq's not even in a place economically to, they're to not rebuild. even talking about mm -hmm. it. Or to be that economical hub. Um, or for this religion that the beast is going to rise from, it, the hub is not in Iraq. Right. And so now, so the final Babylon, given what you've shared so far, um, can you explain why do you think that, that Mecca and Saudi Arabia are the final mystery Babylon? Yeah. So I obviously need to be um, very careful here, and I, I, I sincerely want to be respectful um, mm -hmm. because I do visit Saudi Arabia regularly. Mm -hmm. and I love the country. I, I love the people. I love what's happening there right now. Mm -hmm. um, but as a Christian, um, I don't believe... Islam, um, you know, again, I want to show respect, but from a Christian perspective, in the same way that the Quran um, says that because I believe in the Trinity, um, that I'm actually the great, committing the greatest form of blasphemy imaginable, um, you know, like there's, there's a lot of contention between mm -hmm. religions over the years, but Mecca is unarguably the single greatest city, uh, religious city in the history of mankind. It's far greater than Rome. I mean, again, when we're looking at roughly two billion people mm -hmm. bowing down and praying every day toward the Kaaba, toward Mecca, the Kaaba being that big black cube in the middle, mm -hmm. um, there's no other city that's drawn that much worship, that much devotion. And because I don't believe Islam is the true religion, I have to say that's false religion, that's idolatry. Um, so it is the single greatest city of idolatry, again, from a Christian perspective, mm -hmm. in human history. And that's saying something. That's absolutely saying something. Um, but then when you begin looking at different things like the architecture, some of the imagery and symbolism, um, for example, the Kaaba, again, mm -hmm. 60 feet high, 60 feet wide, long, mm -hmm. this big 60-foot cube. Mm -hmm. On the corner of the cube is a black rock. It's encased with silver, um, and it is shape-like and represents a female uh, sexual organ. And in the center, is this black stone. Um, ask any Muslim where the black stone came from. They don't know. But there is a clear uh, historical connection between the black stone and all sorts of various pagan idols throughout the Middle East. You can see today Diana, Artemis, these various goddesses, the idols, they always would use a meteorite, a black meteorite for the head. You actually see it um, in the book of Acts where they uh, you know, the, they were running out of business because everybody mm -hmm. was converting to Christianity in Ephesus, and they start rioting, mm -hmm. and they say, great is, um, uh, different. I think they say, 
Diana or uh, Artemis mm -hmm. in Ephesus mm -hmm. whose image fell from heaven. Mm -hmm. her, her image yeah. was a meteorite. Mm -hmm. And so Muslims will come, they'll kiss that stone, mm -hmm. and they believe that when they kiss that stone, their sins are forgiven. Well, from a Christian perspective, the only thing that washes a s human sins away is the shed blood of God himself mm -hmm. who sent his very essence into the earth to purchase immortality and eternal life for us. Mm -hmm. It's the blood of Jesus that washes mm -hmm. us, not a meteorite. So you see these type of historical connections. The Kaaba itself is veiled, similar to a woman. Mm -hmm. um, there's clear echoes of ancient astral female war deities, whether it be mm -hmm. Diana, Artemis, um, or even Aphrodite. Mm -hmm. um, you can see sort of the, the sexual, residual sexual elements there. And of course the crescent moon, which we spoke about mm -hmm. in a previous interview. Mm -hmm. In Isaiah 14, um, Satan or Lucifer, the Hebrew word there is Helal ben Sechar, son of the morning star, um, which the very word Helal in Arabic is represents that crescent mm -hmm. moon. So you ask Muslims, why is the crescent moon the symbol of Islam? Where does that come from? And they really can't give a clear answer, but there is a mm -hmm. historical connection back to these Plus, various... Plus uh, Babylon, you know, there's a lot of... They're, they're king of luxury. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think you have to do much research. Most people know, they see it on TikTok and Instagram, where some of the wealthiest people who, um, who live there now, and um, it's a seducer of the nations. Can you speak a little bit about how they also actually uh, corrupt <laughs> different kings and some of the wealth that's happening there and some of the things that are happening there? Yeah. So, if you go back the past 40 years, mm -hmm. Now, I want to be clear, with Mohammed bin Salman, there's a lot of very positive reforms that are happening mm -hmm. in the kingdom right now. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good things that are happening. But if we're talking uh, the history of Saudi Arabia, <clears throat> Saudi Arabia is the single greatest lobby in Washington. There is not, you know, people always talk about the Israel lobby um, or this lobby. Um, Saudi Arabia is the single greatest lobby in the history of the United States. The amount of money that they have given directly to various presidents, mm -hmm. Senators, congressmen and women, um, military leaders is unparalleled. And no one talks about it because so many people are receiving you know, the money. And most politicians know if they play ball, when they get out of office, they'll get a cushy position as mm -hmm. a consultant or on mm -hmm. a board and get a hundred, couple hundred thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. um, the Saudis throw around money and they influence people with it. Not only do they influence the region mm -hmm. with their religion, um, but with money. And throughout the, world, throughout the world right now, if there's a massive mosque or Islamic center in your city, in all likelihood it was funded by Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia is not only the historical womb of Islam, mm -hmm. the fountain of Islam, but it has also over the past 40 years spent more money on the spread of Islam. Um, it's like 10 times more than the entire Protestant, global Protestant church has spent on missions. Wow. This one family has spent more on the spread of Islam to build the mosque, the Islamic mm -hmm. centers. So ideologically, religiously, financially, Saudi Arabia is the womb. Mm -hmm. And so you go, well, how did we end up with ISIS? How did we end up with Hamas? How did we end up with all these things? Mm -hmm. In so many ways, Saudi Arabia was the financier. Now, again, I want to acknowledge some of the positive things that mm -hmm. are happening now, but we can't deny a lot of these historical mm -hmm. realities. You also name it that it's, this city is drunk on the blood of the saints. Yeah, so I mean, again, if you look at Open Doors report, mm -hmm. the primary nations that are persecuting Christians throughout the earth, they're all Muslim majority nations. Mm -hmm. And it's not all Muslims. Look, the vast majority of Muslims are very normal people. Yeah. They just want to raise their kids like you and me. Mm -hmm. um, they don't want to kill Christians, but there is a percentage that are very radical. Mm -hmm. And where does that radicalism come from? Well, you know, some of that radical uh, Wahhabi, Salafi, this is, these are sort of... Uh, sex, if you will, sort mm -hmm. of sex within Islam. Um, that, that's the radical stuff. And again, it, it emanates out of Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And so the ones that are killing and persecuting Christians, whether it be Boko Haram or Al-Shabaab or Jamaat al-Islamiyah, all of these radical mm -hmm. groups, Al-Qaeda, they all have their ideological and financial backing originally from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is kind of like Dr. Frankenstein, who created this monster and now the monster doesn't even like Saudi Arabia, you know. So, for example, you, you mentioned that about how that they are, 
the hated harlot of the Middle East. Yes, because eventually the beast turns on the woman mm -hmm. and destroys her. When I was just in Saudi Arabia, I prayed a prayer. I prayed for the, the Lord to bless the Saudis. I blessed the Saudis for trying to enter into this peace agreement with Israel mm -hmm. and to seek peace. These mm -hmm. are good things. And it was amazing how many Muslims, mostly like Muslim Brotherhood type mm -hmm. of Muslims, um, so these are a little bit more politically active radicals, mm -hmm. they were decrying Saudi Arabia and me, actually saying, well, the Saudi Arabia has Zionists, or you know, why are mm -hmm. they letting these Christians in this type of thing? So it's interesting to see the degree to which many of the radicals around the world hate Saudi Arabia today. Mm -hmm. Even though they largely historically were the ones that funded mm -hmm. them and created them, now they hate them. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what the Bible says. And it's describes. also partially because they see sometimes the hypocrisy a little bit yes. in a lot of the royal family as well, where you know they, they claim to believe in uh, the, the Islam faith, but they also don't practice it completely. Yeah, there's no question about it. I mean, you know, the excess of the Saudi royal family is well documented and. Mm -hmm. um, Money gives them sort of the ability to uh, isolate themselves mm -hmm. and live lives of hypocrisy. And, and so a lot of these, like Osama bin Laden, you know, he was not a member of the Saudi royal family, but mm -hmm. a very wealthy Saudi. Um, he removed himself from that culture and he ended up, you know, living in Afghanistan with the Taliban, right? He, 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 he shunned that mm -hmm. wealthy, lavish, mm -hmm. um, non-Islamic lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So in the summary, we see that in the book of Revelation, the mystery Babylon, it's a literal place, it's a desert city, it's a port or a coastal, city, a coastal city, it's a consumer, not a producer, it's the greatest city of idolatry, it's a religious capital, it's also a, almost like a missionary center. Uh, you mentioned also it's a great seducer of kings and peoples, and you actually, in your book, you highlight different presidents that this particular city already has influenced. Um, it's the city of excess luxury. It's the economic seducer. It's the city of slavery, city that murders Jews and Christians. And she represents royalty. She's hidden in plain sight. And it's a spiritual and financial capital of this um, regime that is going to be producing the beast, the Antichrist. And the way you describe it, I mean, it does fit uh, the current Mecca in Saudi Arabia, but you also give a hint that it, it could change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I want to be clear, I'm not dogmatic about this. Yeah. I wrote this to say, here's another option okay. that really makes sense. And interestingly, at the very, very end of the book, because when I was writing this, I don't even know what year this was, I said, you know, and also Saudi has announced plans to build this massive mega city up in the north called Neom. And this is the part of Saudi Arabia that I go to, and mm -hmm. they're in the process of building something called the line. Have you seen plans for this? Mm -mm. Oh my gosh. So the line is, they're essentially wanting to build something far greater than Dubai. But the line is essentially a city, which is actually going to be two um, buildings that are, I, I don't know the exact dimensions, but they're like three football, three or four football fields tall, and they're a couple hundred miles long. And so this, and, and mirrored on both sides. Oh, yeah, I saw that. I saw that, okay. So they're building that up in the north. And what's interesting about that is that, okay, so this is a little technical, but in Isaiah 34, it's a prophecy about the judgment on Edom. Mm -hmm. And it says her land will burn with pitch. Her streams will be on, in other words, it's not water, it's oil. And it's the land of Edom, and it's judged. And then after it's judged, its smoke rises forever as a testimony of its judgment. Well, it's Revelation 17 and 18, the destruction of Babylon, that draws from Isaiah 34 mm -hmm. for that same imagery of her smoke will go up forever. And I always kind of looked at those two and I go, well, look, Edom and Mystery Babylon, they're really two different things. So I can't make that connection even though Revelation's clearly drawing from Isaiah 34, but here's the reality. Now they're building a city in the land of Edom that very well could be in partnership again with, with Mecca and the kingdom of Saudi Arabia at large, it very much does describe, and this is going to be the center, a uh, global transportation hub mm -hmm. um, that is part of this potential peace agreement with Israel, where Israel will become the center of this transportation route, mm -hmm. thus competing with the Suez Canal, 
-hmm. and thus also competing with this um, land bridge that China is is putting through Afghanistan mm -hmm. in, in partnership with Turkey. Mm -hmm. So it's all a rush to get goods from the East to Europe and the United States, and a lot of this will pass through Israel, which will be a massive economic transformation to the region, but at the heart of this will be this new city they're building mm -hmm. called Neom, which also happens to be in the land of Mount Sinai, which, you know, there's so many passages that describe Yahweh and Jehovah marching from Sinai. You mm -hmm. see it in Deuteronomy 33, in Judges 5, in Psalm 68, mm -hmm. Habakkuk 3, he's mar Isaiah 63, he's marching from the south, from the land mm -hmm. of Sinai, soaked in blood. And so there's a lot of interesting um, things that are coming together, even since I've written the book, mm -hmm. um, and I'm watching them with a lot of interest. In the conclusion, do you think Jesus' return is near? I really do. Um, and as much as I've been preaching this for 20 years, as I'm seeing the things come together, I'm seeing the anti-Semitism, I'm seeing what happened with Hamas and Israel, the protests around the world, I say, I've been preaching that this was going to come, but now that it's here, my stomach is sick. Wow. I don't like to see it. Um, as I'm seeing the, the beginning stages, I think of the great falling away with the fire of the Lord purging the church, judgment begins in the house of God, seeing amazing ministries mm -hmm. collapse and this type of thing. I really feel like it's coming and perhaps I'm wrong, I don't know. I think as Christians we need to have a balance, you know. I send my kids to college. Mm -hmm. I plan for the future, okay. but I also know that based on my very careful analysis of prophecy, we could be entering the final seven years. It could be very soon. I mean, it could be within the next few years. The, the landscape, the geopolitical landscape of the world is lining up with the geopolitical landscape that the prophets described. Uh -huh. And so we need to be ready. We need is there to any other signs in the scripture that the Bible predicts that need to come to pass before the coming of Antichrist or before the coming of the Great Tribulation? I mean, I think the, 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 the key event that happens will be the Antichrist engages in a covenant with many. Mm -hmm. um, Daniel, again, 9, 26, 27. And so that hasn't happened yet, mm -hmm. but the Antichrist would have to emerge first. Um, but arguably, there may be nothing profound that needs to take place. I probably expect mm -hmm. some regional wars um, some shift, shifting uh, in the Middle East, but again, it... Well, there's a lot of shift that's been happening last month. Yeah, yeah, and exactly, and these things can happen rapidly. Mm -hmm. So, again, the point is our hearts need to be ready. Our hearts need to be prepared. We don't know the timing. We need to be watching. Um, we, we need to stop all the guesswork. I think that's dangerous. We do that mm -hmm. a lot. The main issue is to be ready, mm -hmm. and I certainly feel the urgency on my heart, mm -hmm. unlike any time I ever have. Mm -hmm. People will listen to this and say, well, you guys are spreading fear. Um, this is not helping for people to win souls and make disciples. You know, we have to just focus more on having the kingdom of God conquer our culture. Um, but what you're saying is that we're not sitting and just watching we're engaged, and what should Christians, what should their position be right now in these last days? Well, again, urgency. Mm -hmm. All of this stuff is, is about urgency, urgency for holiness, urgency for evangelism, mm -hmm. urgency, urgency to complete the Great Commission. But to those who do say this, well, you shouldn't talk about these things, you're spreading fear. Well, then Jesus and Paul and all of the apostles were also guilty. The New Testament would be guilty of the same thing. The reality is the single greatest revival that has happened in the United States um, in my lifetime was the Jesus Revolution. And there were two things happening there. The Holy Spirit was moving in a powerful way, but also people were looking at biblical prophecy. They were mm -hmm. reading Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great yeah. Planet Earth. That was a massive impetus for that revival. Israel had been reestablished mm -hmm. as a nation just you know, a couple decades before that. And so oftentimes prophecy is a profound impetus for evangelism, for revival. In fact, when you look at the prophets, when you look at their evangelism techniques, 
they say, this is that which was spoken of by the prophets. So the ability of Christians today to properly um, understand and articulate biblical prophecy and to be able to point unbelievers and say, what is happening right now with these protests around the world, this is exactly what the prophets described. To make that connection, I'll call it um, uh, apocalyptic evangelism, I think that was actually the single most important tool in the mm -hmm. apostles' arsenal. Mm -hmm. And so rather than walk away from it and shun it and put it on the shelf, I think we should learn to harness it and use it. Mm -hmm. But we're not expecting, you're not preaching mainly this um, sudden um, rapture that everybody was supposed, is supposed to be prepared, but that we're preparing and we're expecting the return of Jesus. But we know according to the scripture, before his return, that things are going to get worse. And we are walking, doing everything that we can. And in fact, one of the uh, things that you highlight also is that you don't believe that Antichrist or his regime will conquer 100% get a world domination. He will not dominate all of the world. Yeah, there's no way he'll conquer Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not anyway. Look. So we all, we all should move to Texas. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Mike, uh, you know, I have two daughters in college. They work hard all semester. And as a Christian, we strive to be faithful throughout our entire lives. But at the end of the semester are the finals. Mm -hmm. And the finals can make or break your grade. You can fail out. You can do great all semester and fail out with the finals. Um, the Bible frames the great tribulation as the finals. The final test, not just individually, but corporately for the church. And I really believe that the finals are coming, the great test. And it will be our greatest opportunity to either fail or shine. And we will have the opportunity, you know, many Christians, they sort of fantasize. They go, oh, you know, I'm going to hide Jews in my basement. You know, they kind of look back at World mm -hmm. War II. Mm -hmm. This is our opportunity to fix the mistakes and failures of our past and to actually stand with the Jewish people as the satanic rage explodes across the earth. It will be the church's final opportunity to bear witness to a lost world concerning a crucified Messiah as we corporately, as the body of Christ, embrace the cross and demonstrate the mercy of God to sinners even as he demonstrated it to us mm -hmm. by laying down our lives for our enemies. It's a beautiful opportunity, not just a horrific test trial that we have to go mm -hmm. through. And so we need to be ready for that opportunity, but the only way we prepare is not someday when the tribulation gets here, then we'll really be faithful. We prepare by being faithful now. That's good. That when the trials, the tests, the difficulties, the challenges happen, mm -hmm. we face them boldly now. That's how we prepare for mm -hmm. the great test to come. That's good. Well, Jill, thank you uh, so much for um, this encouragement as well as your book. I know that this, even talking about this, can get us into trouble. I know that you're probably living with that risk and I appreciate your boldness and uh, being courageous and being um, loving but also um, strong in your conviction in portraying that and you're not just someone who's hiding somewhere here. You actually go to the very nations that we just talked about and so that, that speaks uh, a, lot of, a lot about your character and if somebody wants to learn more about your ministry where they can get your resources or um, download maybe this book, buy this book or other books, where they can find you. So I'm at uh, joelstrumpet.com is my website. And I'll actually just say, if anybody watching this is so bold that you want to come with me to Saudi Arabia, um, I actually take tours. I bring groups multiple times every year to visit the real Mount Sinai. We can actually see each year the progress of this city that's being built. Really? And so if you just Google my name and type in Living Passages, that's actually the tour company I use. Okay. And it's actually, not only do I go there, I love the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, I love the people, um, and it's actually one of the highlights. What is there, uh, do they know that you wrote this book? Um, I don't know, I haven't, okay. I haven't talked to them about it. Okay. <laughs> when you go in there, you just present other books. Um, and how often do you t take these tours? Um, so two or three times a year. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. The Saudi awesome. people are so hospitable. Mm -hmm and so excited to have tourists, because tourism mm -hmm. is new within the past few years. Okay. And so it's a blessing. It's a blessing and a privilege. Okay. Well, thank you, Joe. Thank you so much, Vlad.